I want to thank uh, Georgia Toto for inviting me to speak today, and I also want to thank him for welcome, welcome from uh, History Church. <laughs> so, um, Stephanie was right. I came in, uh, basically I'm a researcher, a historical researcher, and uh, I moved here about 12 years ago or 13 years ago. And I live near an intersection of two roads, Sixes Road and Bell's Ferry Road, for those who know the area. And I kept wondering why they called Sixes Road Sixes. I can never see that that way, you know? So I said, well, I looked it up and I couldn't find anything. I thought maybe it was Sykes's Road or some other name, a family name. So I went to uh, the Historical Society when it was still the Historical Society in the old marble courthouse on the third floor. And that's where I first met Stephanie and the staff. And I said, you know, what's the sixes all about? And Stephanie found me a reference. And I said, I also want to know where Bell's Ferry is. Well, we went to history books, and there was nothing that said where Bell's Ferry was. So at that moment, I became a historical researcher, not because I wanted to, but because I needed to to find the answers to my questions. So for me, researching, and I know we have some researchers here, so I'm just going to share a little bit about kind of how I research things and, and the, the basis for how I do it. I research things based on what I call connect the dots. You know, when we're uh, kids, we have the connect the dot game where you can <laughs> connect the dots. Numerically, you come up with a picture. And the more dots there are, the more intricate the picture is. Sometimes it's just like a circle, yay, you know, and sometimes it's very intricate. And I found that researching history is similar to this, except that there's no numbers to follow. So you have to find one dot and then find <coughs> other connections to that dot and start making the pattern. Um, sometimes it's more like building a, a jigsaw puzzle where you have pieces, and anyone who builds jigsaw puzzles know you, you find a piece and go, that's interesting, it's kind of like the color of over there, and you move them around, and sometimes they connect, sometimes they don't, sometimes they connect to other things. And you get to a point, and for, uh, that's kind of how I do it. I, each puzzle piece is like a dot, and the intricate pattern that makes it adjust is like the line. And as a researcher, you're kind of like a detective, so you're looking for and put them together. And I always go for the oldest pieces, puzzle pieces I can find, usually old documents, artifacts, something that came from the period of time that I'm researching. Now, you can find these here in libraries. You can find them in archives. You can find them in courthouses. Um, and you can even find them online now, which brings up a very interesting fact that anybody here who wants to be a researcher can be a researcher. When my hair got blonder and I wasn't working, so <laughs> when I wasn't working so much, I realized that I could go online and actually search a lot of primary source materials, and uh, it's it's a way that we can all stay busy doing things if we're not already researchers. Well, each one of these pieces of information to me was a dot. And dots are people, places, things, and events in the way that I look at it. And they connect with a line, obviously. And I found that the smallest unit of connection, if you think about it, is always two things that are connected by a line. So this was the smallest unit of connection of anything that I could find. And I looked for like a forensic term for this. I never could find one, so I invented the Datsun line. <laughs> it's just two dots, dots and a line. So it's a Datsun line. So, so, so whenever, That's awesome. When I research, we have a lot of information. Well, I'll take information and I'll keep kind of distilling it down until I get to the smallest unit to the dots and line, and then I start to connect dots and lines. 
So when you see that word, it just it's pronounced and it means exactly kind of what it says, not some lines. But historians <clears throat> take the dots and lines, and they don't often connect because the records of history don't fill in all the gaps. <coughs> so historians will fill in the gap with how they assume it is or how they interpret the history of what probably took place in the gap areas. And it's the same thing with connecting the dots. The lines don't always uh, match up. Narratives, the stories that the historians write, are taught in schools. Sometimes there are textbooks. But the historians write a narrative or a story about what happened, filling in those gaps quite often. But the narrative can never be 100% accurate because we don't have all the puzzle pieces at any one time and probably never will for historical events. Well, when you tell a story, there's nothing wrong with a good old-fashioned history story. They're exciting, they, they lead us to hear about things we've never heard before, but all history stories are not necessarily accurate. So we have to pay attention to how much of a story the narrative is. One famous storyteller and filmmaker puts it this way, he says, I think after we make a film, we sort of backfill it with intellectual stuff. But at the end of the day, I'm a storyteller. I happen to work in American history. He continues on talking about historical facts. He says, we're all aware of history, which is the excavation of brittle facts and dates. Now for a researcher to consider the elements of history as brittle facts and dates, I mean, they're kind of exciting to any of us who are researchers, so it's, it's not strictly brittle facts and dates. This person goes on to say, what I'm trying to do, not being a historian, but a documentary filmmaker, is to look at the highest, higher emotional truth, which, because I deal in history, means that I do excavations of an emotional archaeology. Well, that's Ken Burns saying all of this. And Ken Burns is considered to be kind of a historian, and his documentaries are studied even in school today. And yet he's backfilling stories with intellectual stuff, backfilling with facts to a story that he's already established. Because most people who are not historians who write about history have a particular theme or a point that they're trying to make. And so sometimes, mold the facts around the story. One of the most famous and <coughs> most quoted eyewitness account of the tragic Trail of Tears is an account by a soldier who accompanied the Cherokee across the uh, plains to the Cherokee Trail. It gives us a glimpse of what happened, the emotions that he felt, the problem with his story, or this story, is it's not true. It never happened. It's the John G. Burnett letter. It's been used in all levels of academia, quoted, it's quoted in almost every history book about the Trail of Tears that you'll ever read. And yet, it's a manufactured story. The dots don't align when you study the story itself. <clears throat> and few people have ever studied the story and looked to verify it because it's such a good story and it's been around for so long. When you actually take a look at the story, you find that the dots that are mentioned in the story <coughs> don't align with the story. They don't connect. They're free-flowing free kind of in, in the story. Uh, we call it dot dropping, like name dropping. <laughs> you just start throwing in historic names and places and dates, and you kind of make it seem like it's the, the story, but it, it isn't the story. The main dot that is not ever connected in this is that 
of, there were no soldiers that traveled with the Cherokee across the plains. There was one, but in general, there were no soldiers that traveled with the Cherokee across the plains. And that's the main dot that doesn't get connected in the story. I just found out recently that there's a genre of writing called creative historical nonfiction. Now, I was an English major, and creative and nonfiction never could go in the same phrase. <laughs> you couldn't do that. But anyway, this is there is a new genre called this, and I looked for the definition of that, and I couldn't find it, so I kept reading through essays about it, and one lady finally came up with a couple of lines that stood out. She said, pure nonfiction never invents dialogue, facts, or events. I agreed with that. Her next line was, creative nonfiction shouldn't either, theoretically. <laughs> <laughs> when you make a statement like that, it's like you've been free reign to start to take the facts and bend them around so they fit the narrative. And we find a lot of creative, non uh, creative historical nonfiction happening from the these days, and especially you find it online. That's a really good place to find some uh, creative nonfiction. So when you relate this to history, a question comes up, and that's, what is history anyway? And in the Oxford Dictionary, they say, it's the study of past events. Sounds good. But can you really do that? Can you really study a past event? Like each of you on your trip over here, you, you had an event that happened. But right now, none of us could like show it to anybody else for them to study. Because the past event happens and it's gone. So there's nothing there to show anybody or have them study it. So you can't study a past event directly. So as I looked into that, I found out that past events in history are two entirely different things. Past events are the actual events that took place, and histories are a narrative or a story written about those events. So it'd be like if I had a bright red Ferrari here, and I had a description of it, we'd want to go look at the real thing if we could, not read about it in the story. And that's what happens with histories. We can't get to the real event that took place, so we have to depend on stories or the evidence that's left from the actual event. So now we have history, but why is it so important? Why is history important? Well, history makes us understand our world and allows us to learn from the past and move into the future. If we didn't have history, we'd still be sticking our fingers in light sockets and things like that. So <laughs> history is a very valuable thing, and accurate history is a very valuable thing. Gerda Lerner says, the main thing history teaches us is that human actions have consequences, and certain choices, once made, cannot be undone. They foreclose the possibility of making other choices, and thus they determine future events. So the choices are made based on the history that we know about. The knowledge of, the accurate knowledge of history is important because as George Orwell says, and this is a quote that really rings with me, says the most effective way to destroy people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history. Yeah, kind of have to think about that one for a while, but it's a very powerful statement. Destroy people by obliterating and denying their history. There are many ways to deny and obliterate history. Primary source evidence suggests that some of the stories connected with the fall of the Cherokee Nation, the removal, and the Trail of Tears might not be completely accurate. We have missing areas, or areas that haven't been brought out to the public very much. And I believe that existing stories can sometimes deny and obliterate 
our ability to look at our uh, our own histories. Like the Burnett letter, if you take the Burnett letter and you believe it, well, that precludes you from looking further for more information because you think you've got it. It's such a good letter, you think you've got it. And then you don't. So, um, paying attention to other sources about the future, uh, there's another story behind the stories that were normally taught. What I've found from the resources that I've studied is that things that came before the removal, events that were happening, choices that were being made in the Cherokee Nation in the United States, some of that type of history is happening now again in our time. There are certain very similar things happening and I recommend people reading about what happened before the Trail of Tears and the removal, as well as totally understanding the removal. Very, very important things. If we don't understand it, history repeats. And as one fellow says, every time history repeats, the price goes up. <laughs> <laughs> it seems we've all have personal experience with that. And uh, it seems to be true. <clears throat> so going back bef to before where I was at talking about past events, what do historians actually study if they can't study the event itself? Well, a British historian, Susanna Lipscomb, says the past did exist, the events of history did happen. Our job as historians is to get at them as best as possible on the basis of evidence in a way that fits the facts that we can establish. It's this forensic interrogatory process that's the joy of being a historian. So she's talking about evidence and facts and a system to find that evidence and facts. And she really believes in building the story around the facts and not the other way, not that creative nonfiction. Another person talks about historians, says, a historian writing a book typically imposes a narrative on the past to make a point about the present or to further an argument in his specialty. It's not dishonest, but it's how they get things done. But I'm interested in the past on its own terms. So this person is more like a researcher. He wants to know the past on its own terms. He wants to study the I'm assuming he wants to study the facts and the evidence rather than creating a story or a narrative. So to quickly recap what we just went over, I'd suggest always checking your primary sources, check the sources even, check the narratives, make sure that the dots do align and connect. When you're researching something, look earlier to the earlier events, not just the event that you're looking at, because <coughs> earlier choices determine the later events. On the topic of the removal, I believe the Trail of Tears, the removal, should never have happened. Now, you know, it's 200 years later, but it shouldn't have happened. The Cherokee suffered greatly uh, and died for really no good reason. <coughs> when I look at the source material, there, I believe there were ways it could have been avoided. It wasn't, so you can't work with that. But I, if you look at the things that built up prior to the removal, there were, I believe, ways to head it off. But one has to look before the event itself. That story prior to the removal is a big story, a major story that we all should understand. Now we do have other source materials besides the uh, Burnett letter that we can look at to get an idea of what the Trail of Tears itself was like. There's a few, uh, there were some wagon, there was a wagon driver who left some material, there were several 
reverends who left diaries of, of their uh, trips across. And when we take the Burnett letter out, we have to take all of it out. Like none of that happened. And then we have to replace it with information that did actually happen. The material that came prior to this, before the removal took place, we can find primary sources from the Chief Ross, who was uh, trying to save his people here. There were two political parties in the Cherokee Nation, main political parties. One wanted to stay, the other one believed it was best to go. They had the Ross Party and the Treaty Party. And both of these parties have documents that you can read and get a sense for where they were coming from and how the interaction of everything happened that built up to the removal and the Trail of Tears. So I'm pushing primary source pretty hard because it's where the actual information is. We followed primary source material when I started my investigation of Fort Buffington. Uh, I had an interest of, in finding out where this Fort Buffington thing was. I had run into it 10 or 20 years ago, the sign up on <laughs> Highway 20. I thought it was a Civil War fort, and I really didn't give it much in, more thought until I started studying the removal, and I realized it was a removal <laughs> fort built in 1837-1838. And we're to the point on the research about Fort Buffington where we actually are looking at a particular plot of land where we believe the fort was. It's been lost for about a hundred years or so. And nobody has any records of where it is. It's about five miles east of here, but that's about as close as we could get. There's always going to be missing puzzle pieces in our effort to find something. And for some reason, the location of the fort has an incredible amount of missing puzzle pieces with it. They may be lost, they may be, have been destroyed, or they may be waiting there somewhere in some dusty book for one of us to find. But at the moment, we're going on very limited information to find the fort itself. The pieces of information we're looking for are artifacts. That's the materials that came down from the time period itself. It's not anything a historian wrote about. It's actually the stuff that came from that time period. And artifacts are the main things that we want to use for evidence. Artifact is anything that's made or used by man. That's the definition. So when you look around the room, everything, anything made or used by man is an artifact. And those are just, the ones we're looking for are just older artifacts. When I diagrammed this out with my Dotson line part, I found out that an artifact was a man-made artifact. Again, it comes down to just two dots in a line. Man-made artifact. And by connecting those, we move along in our research. And it could be, it could be, that man has only one basic purpose, and that is to survive. And he may have only one basic ability, and that ability is to make artifacts. That thinking comes from looking just at the dots and line of the artifact. Obviously, there's more to life than just survival, but <clears throat> in its most basic, that may be true. So after using and recovering dots and lines for some time, it finally hit me that I was always looking at the dots, and I didn't pay as much time looking at the line. And I found out, as I researched it more, the line is always at its most basic, the intention to survive. When everything else is happening and it, it, more complex, that basic survival me mechanism is what creates what happens between the man and the artifact. He creates the artifact to survive better. Another interesting thing about the line is the line is the non material part of life. Dots are the material parts, the line is the non material. Like thoughts, ideas, emotions, and beliefs. And those are the motiva motivating factors about surviving better and the reason <coughs> people make artifacts.
It seems like the artifact of the dot, the dots of mind of the artifact expresses the basic mechanism of human history, the relationship of man, his spirit, mind, and emotions to his survival in a material world and the evidence of that relationship. There are artifacts that cannot be found in museums. These are artifacts that are part of the site of a historical site. It can't be moved. Now, it could be something like a house, it's above the ground, you can't move it. It could be a wall. It could be in-ground information, like a well shaft, or burial, or trenches, pits, post holes, and even latrines. Now, latrines may seem an unusual thing, but to an archaeologist, it's a gold mine. <laughs> Studies have shown that when people just sit around, they lose things. And when they lose those things, they stay lost. It's kind of like when you go to Las Vegas, the things that happen in Las Vegas stay in Las Vegas. The dreams are extremely interesting to archaeologists. History is, is trapped there. And believe me, we're looking for the latrine on the site that we're, we're investigating now. We haven't found it yet, though. So when we search for features that are in the ground, part of the ground, every time you move the ground, you're destroying the evidence. You're destroying the thing that you're looking for, because excavation is a very destructive process and has to be done very, very carefully. So we're trying to use methods that do not cause destruction of the site in order to investigate the site so that at some point we can get pinpointed excavations done and, and avoid disturbing more than we need to. We start stacking layers of information Initially, the first layer is documentary evidence, and that's stuff about the fort, information about the fort, possible locations, and we followed that information to the fort site itself. <coughs> From there on, we want to use remote sensing capabilities. This is more modern technology for the most part. Initially, when we get out of sight, we just look with our eyes and do a visual inspection. Then we take photographs so that we can look at the site even if we're not at the site. And we notice if there's divots and where the houses are and where the trees are and where the rock walls might be. And if we see any indentations or old roadbed that might be there. <clears throat> then we start moving to some systems of finding things. Dowsing, which is the far left one, is most of us remember the guy with the willow stick that finds water? That's dowsing. Well, in modern day, people use things more often that are metal uh, wires. And as the dowser walks along, these wires do all kinds of things. Sometimes they'll cross, sometimes they go apart, sometimes they spin around. I, I watched the dowser do his thing, and it's kind of unusual. It tells us, if we map out what he's doing, it tells us something about right here caused something to happen, and over there caused something else to happen. And sometimes the operator will say, well, I think this is that, or this is the other thing. It's not highly scientific, but I've seen it, some amazing things come out of dowsing. A, a modern day dowsing is metal detecting. Now, most of us think the metal detector is the guy you see at the beach, or out in the park, and he's going along digging up coins, and artifacts, put them in his pocket, and the next day they're on eBay. Well, that's tremendously destructive. That's not the kind of metal detecting that we do when we're researching. We use the metal detector to find targets. We can find where a hit is. We can mark it with a flag. And the modern metal detectors can tell us even the different kinds of metals that might be under there. So we don't know what it is, but we know that it is. There is something there. You can mark them with flags, and then you get a feel. When you're done, you have a mapping of where all the targets are, and you can see concentrations of where metal is. You can see trails of metal that might go off in one direction. 
and we still haven't disturbed any ground, but we get a lot of information about the patterns of the metal on the site. Another thing about a metal detector that many people don't know is it does tell you some characteristics of the soil. And there's a readout usually that tells you if you're over a clay soil or if you're over a loamy soil or if, the, if you run into an area that might be a burn pit. It shows different characteristics of the soil. So we can also map that out, a layer of mapping that gives us particular points that we can go back to study later and see if they align with any of the points that come from our other methods of remote sensing. Um, we started with mapping hits. And when we got to this one site that we were led to by the documents, there were so many hits you almost couldn't count them. And we knew we were some onto something, but not quote, didn't know what. And at that point, I contacted the Division of Natural Resources. I contacted the State Preser Historical Preservation Officer. Then I actually contacted some of you may have known Frank Norris, who was with the National Park Service and was part of the Trail of Tears program. And I kept telling him, we've got something. Can, can you send somebody out to, to help us with this or take a look or at least something? We could get no interest going. Frank, I talked to Frank Norris a couple of times a year and we go, he, but he just didn't have resources that he could send out to us to, to research any further. All we knew is that there was a highway improvement project coming right towards the site. And if something didn't get done, this highway was going to blast right through and destroy everything. So at that point, after checking with some local archaeologists, they said, you just need more information. You just keep presenting more and more information and something will happen. So at that point, we decided to do some shovel testing or digging up of artifacts that we found with the metal detector. We ended up at the moment with over a thousand artifacts. And we're talking about less than two acres. And there's probably twice that many left. We tried to take as few out as possible. We'd find artifacts that were as early as the 1800s and as late as modern day, or probably 1950s on some of those. So the, it was a site that's been used for some time. And the archaeologists all said, you've got a historical site here. You just don't have proof that it's the fort. Proof for the fort is going to be a little bit difficult. The, the fort was manned by volunteer militia soldiers. And these were fellows who just came in off the farms and out of the towns in their normal militia groups. They didn't have buttons that said U.S. military. They didn't have spoons that had U.S. on it. They're, the type of artifacts you find are just the kind that you'd find in a normal homestead or in a normal community. And obviously, we found a lot of that. Although we did find this, this artifact up here is actually a, a rifle part, but it's from this Maynard tape uh, mechanism for priming a, a musket but it came from the 1850s. So that was something that probably was getting converted more towards the Civil War. But we didn't find any other military stuff besides that. <clears throat> so not being able to find anything that works from the artifact standpoint and not wanting to dig anymore, we went back to the remote sensing and we found ground penetrating radar, which looks like a lawnmower that people run across the area and it gives you a cross section and it gives you uh, also a horizontal mapping of where things are. Here you can see this is the normal top layer of ground and then the, here something happened, something dug through there and created that layer to look differently. Now if we look at it from on top, it'll show up a little bit differently but also on a horizontal map, which is another layer of information that we can put. The operator can tell you that something is down there, but not what. He might have an idea, but it's not a certainty. 
So again, we just mark it on, on the map and overlay it on all the other remote sensing we do. After we did this, I still wanted to know more without destroying anything. So I, we got one of the leading experts actually in the world for GPR and magnetometry to come out and do a magnetometry survey. Now a magnetometer, it looks like he's pulling a rickshaw. It's a highly, highly sophisticated tool. It doesn't look like it. But uh, it sends electrical magnetic waves into the ground, which get reflected and mapped out. And you'll see dark areas, light areas, uh, gray areas, and they know how to read this stuff. This particular one, where those arrows go, those are all grays, the dark, the dark ones. And we, we have been concerned that there may be grays on the site that we're looking at, and there are anomalies that show up, but nothing that's really indicating this certain of a grave. So, go ahead. The red on there, is that the actual, shows up on this as red for the headstone? No, he's, he must be looking at, sadly, and the, and the guy that we did did the same thing, is he marks on there and it covers over what you want to okay. see. <laughs> so, I'm he's, thinking, that couldn't be possible. No, it's, they're not, they George Floyd didn't red. do that. <laughs> those, are, those are his marks, and uh, I don't know what he's seen because the, the marker is kind of overlaying what we really want to look at. But he, he, they can see it, they've done it. The, the good guys really <clears throat> have an idea of what's... Is that left to right or is that top to bottom imagery going down from some sensing device? This would be like, uh, <laughs> like a, a horizontal layer. Okay, so so this, is, depth. this isn't depth, but this is over the top. With, magnet with the, the prior one, we could get depth. Yeah. Here we, we can't get depth that I know of. I've so how do you seen. determine those were graves? Uh, He's being educated. Yeah, he knows what he's doing, <laughs> and, and I don't. Uh, different organic things show up differently. I know organic material shows up dark, and metallic things are usually white and black. They're called a dipole. They'll have a white and a black together on a thing. Hey, I don't see any dipoles in here. So we know that's organic. The dark is probably organic material, and when it's three feet by five feet, he probably has some idea that, or six feet, that that's his headstone for you. And he's just marking that the headstones are on that side of the of the of the grave. So after we had done this, one day I was driving out to the site, and I saw two fellows out in a field near where we think the site is. And they were digging this square hole. Now, that's usually indicative of an archaeologist doing a shovel pit test where they do a little excavation and see if there's anything in there. So I said, well, I'm going to go talk to this fellow. So I pulled off the road, walked up to him, and I said, hey, you guys looking for the fort? Now, archaeologists are very tight-lipped because we're not allowed to give out information about things. So he couldn't say, yes, we're looking for the fort. All he could say was, uh, well, yeah, we're just digging around. No chance. <laughs> so I said, yeah, I can see that. I said, well, I just have an interest. My name's Larry Gold, and I said, I've written a book about Fort Buffington. And at that point, he said, I, I know about you. And I said, OK. And so I, we started talking a little bit more loose about what we could talk about. And I said, I want to tell you that we've got another site over here a distance from here, I didn't give him the details. But I said, we <laughs> he can't give details. So I said, uh, we've got another site, and we found a lot of artifacts. And we think it's over there. Yeah. So he was he was over there for yeah, I'd already checked the area that he was in. So I knew he was not going to be finding very much over there. So the day after we talked to him, I get a call from the Georgia Department <laughs> of Transportation archaeologist, the head archaeologist, and said, Hey, can we set up a meeting? We'd like to see what you got. Can you do a presentation for us? So we put together a presentation similar to this about what we found, how we found it, why we suspect this to be the site, and the fact that we had a whole bunch of artifacts. But during this meeting, they said, is there any chance we can get a hold of those artifacts? We'll clean them up, we'll tell you what we think they are, 
and we'll catalog them for you. And I said, good deal. So we agreed to let them take the artifacts and analyze them. The head archaeologist also at that point said, we would like you to be consulting parties to the historic preservation part of the uh, highway project. And I said, I'd be happy to be because I have information that may be useful to you. So we got into much more conversation about the site from that point on. But I'm sworn to secrecy, so if anybody thinks by the end of this talk you're going to know exactly where our site is, <laughs> it's not going to happen. Larry, are you at least going to tell us why the Burnett letter is not true? Yeah, the main one. I, oh, I can't. Afterwards. Okay, okay. let me. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so they, the, they also asked us not to do any more physical research on the site. And they asked us that because if the highway goes around the site, which they're recommending, they won't pay any attention to the site. It's up to us to find that if it's to prove it a site or not. If they do come through the site, because the engineers may or may not approve going around it, it's going to be very expensive to go around it. If they come through it, then GDOT's going to have to do the excavation. And they're going to have to write reports upon reports, extremely detailed, about the fort so that all that information is captured so that we have it for the future references. So they don't want us messing around on the site. I totally understand that. So while they we're in the middle of this moratorium of digging or checking around on the site, I decided, well, we'll start taking all these layers of information that we have and start seeing if certain things align. Because <coughs> dots and lines can align through the different layers of information that we got. And in many cases, they do. So after about two years of sitting around, <clears throat> not doing anything, I said, i got to do something. <laughs> I can't sit here because GDOT goes very slowly. And in fact, they're getting very close to the site, and we still don't know which way they're going to go yet. And that was from, uh, that's like four, three years ago, something like that. So there's a new technology that came along called LIDAR. It's light detection and ranging. And it's basically a very complicated and electronic way of <laughs> connecting the dots. They take an airplane or a drone, which happened here, they put their equipment on the bottom of it, and it shoots out 10,000 dots of LIDAR, of laser beam per second, 10,000 dots per second as it flies along. Those dots are reflected back up and they're mapped in three dimensions. The interesting thing is it's still dots and lines. <laughs> Trillions of dots. Trillions of dots. They can make a 3D model of it and again, we're not going to know exactly what we're looking at, but we can look for anomalies or things that correspond to other things that we did. Now, this is an actual slide from part of the 240 acres that we had surveyed. LIDAR is an expensive proposition. We're looking at about two acres here, and it looks like an overhead shot. You've got trees, there's a field, there's terracing up in the corner. On that side, there's a line of trees going up and down in this case, but that's a creek bed. And then there's a road, edge of a road up the to top. So the interesting thing about the model that they have is we can zoom in, we can zoom away, I can turn the thing, we can tilt the ground. I can actually go down to that uh, empty field tilt the ground, and I can walk under the trees. And I can see the trees on the side of me, I can see what's on the ground. It's unbelievable technology. For us, the most important thing about the technology is you can tell the computer, please take away everything that isn't the ground, the surface of the ground. And when you do that, this happens. 
kind of looks like you're on the moon or Mars or something. <clears throat> and this is exactly what we were looking at a moment ago. The tree line actually comes out beyond this ridge, ridgy stuff. But we can see indentations, we can see all kinds of information of the surface of the ground. And you notice all this was under trees. The trees were here, and yet we can, the beams at 10,000 a second, they go around the leaves from different angles, and they still pull out the information from underneath. It's not as detailed under here as it would be out in a field. But at this point, even with this, we can change the lighting. Now we zoomed in just a little bit, but this is that same little ridge. I doubt that this is much more than a foot high. <clears throat> but we start to see other characteristics. The terracing is still up there, but it looks a little bit different as we move the light. And we can start to look for anomalies or things that aren't normal to nature. So it could be uh, right angles are a main thing that you look for. Um, so obviously this isn't part of the site that we're looking at, but uh, a couple of you might recognize this site. I'll say that much. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> so when we're looking at this, we you can get down to looking at a square foot, and you can take the square foot and you can move it around and you can change the lighting. So analyzing this data is crazy because we're we got 240 acres to go through. It's, it's really neat, but it's very, very time consuming. So we're in the middle of doing that kind of research right now to see if we can find more clues to where the fort is. I can say that some of the anomalies that we found do align with other anomalies that we found from other remote sensing methods that we use. So we're on to something we think. And by stacking all of those, when you get a number of them that all align, that's probably going to be a good place to excavate because something's going on there, we just don't know what. <clears throat> I ran into an interesting thing that happened. I was on the Trail of Tears Facebook page, and somebody made a statement that was, I knew was not supported by primary research or primary source material, and I just said, please check your sources before you make a statement like that. Well, it ended up being kind of a firefight. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a couple of you kind of ran through about that time and, and were not part of it, but uh, saw it going on. I was called all kinds of names, and, uh, and anyway, one person did stand up for me, and she said, you know, give this guy a chance. He didn't say anything other than check your sources. I don't know why you're jumping at him, because uh, it, was, it was pretty mean, some of that stuff. And this person and I had a few comments back and forth on that site, and she mentioned that her family ancestors came from this area. And so I said, well, would you be interested in talking more messaging or off, how, however you do where you're not going through the, where everybody sees it. <clears throat> we ended up doing emailings back and forth. But this person, <clears throat> the family ancestors come back to this area. Uh, in fact, her family is Cherokee. And some of you know the name Chief George Welch. Chief George Welch was a minor chief who lived about 10 miles east of here on Setting Down Creek. And he had a, a sawmill that he milled lumber that actually went into the construction of Fort Buffington. So I said, well, that's interesting. You really do know the area. She's a genealogist, had information about people in this area that I'd never heard about. I mean, I've heard people, but I didn't know that information. And she's related to many of those also. During our discussion, I said, you know, I really think that the Army should come out here and find their fort, because they're the ones that lost it. They should have <laughs> <laughs> they should have, they should know where it was. It's their fort. 
why am I looking for you? She said, well, that's interesting. My son's in the Army. I said, well, good. Send him down. <laughs> so she said, he's a cadet at West Point. I said, wow. Send him down. She said, well, he's a history major at West Point. I said, this is getting better. What else we got? So I said, let me find out if I can contact him directly. So he did. He was very, very interested in this project because not only did his ancestors come from here, but provided wood for the fort. Uh, but Chief Walsh was also a signer of the Treaty of 1835. So it, there's much layers to, to what's coming together, the dots, the dots and the lines that are coming together here. So I said, well, this, this is all extremely interesting. And then I said, I'm going to look into getting this LIDAR survey done so that we have more to work with. I contacted uh, the archaeologists who we worked with before. They gave me two names of LIDAR people. One was extremely, extremely busy. The other one, he said, does this kind of cutting edge stuff that you can't talk about. I said, that guy, give me his number. <laughs> Whatever he's got, I wanted to find out what that is. So I called Bill up. We talked for about an hour. And I said, well, where are you located? He said, well, I'm located in Oklahoma at such and such a place. And I said, well, do you know this other town? And he said, yeah, I'm 15 minutes from there. Well, it ends up the LIDAR guy is 15 minutes from my new Facebook friend and her family. <laughs> so when that, when that final line was drawn, I said, there's no question this is the, a new part of our uh, research team. And we all got together and we started the research. He's doing research from the military aspect at West Point and getting documents, hopefully, that none of the rest of us could really get to very easily. When we did the LIDAR, this lady and her two sons came out. He actually got to fly the drone for a while, and it was quite a good time, and I got to meet the family. We're all still doing research now uh, in our different areas, and hopefully we'll be getting together again soon. We do have some future things. From this whole connection, we do have some future stuff coming up. One is we're going to be doing, it looks like, relatively soon, a new GPR ground penetrating radar layer that's going to be done much more intricately and detailed than the last one was. <clears throat> we have a chance of doing another LIDAR flyover with some other equipment. Uh, that will depend somewhat on the funding that I can put together because it's expensive. And then we're going to be in a position to maybe have uh, an excavation team come out and actually excavate to see if we can find proof of the fort, and that should be very exciting. I, I, uh, I can't give you too many details on some of that, but it, it's generated out of this new alliance that we kind of have put together. Oh, one note on the original LIDAR, <clears throat> they did have a very experimental thing that they were doing. They had a little package, it looked like a little suitcase, that was $350,000 worth of equipment, <laughs> that they were putting on a $150,000 drone to fly over and do some specialized surveying. And the drone took off and then disappeared over the, <laughs> the trees. And the operator's going, he had his big eyes, <laughs> a half a million dollars worth of stuff off, getting off on its own. <laughs> did coax it back and landed it. Uh, they didn't take off again. <laughs> it ends up that the equipment uh, frequencies of however it works was getting in the way of the frequency of the uh, navigation equipment. And it took off. And there were like six guys going, uh, what are we do now? That was a scary moment. So I'll wrap up now. Basically, Please pay attention, look for and search for primary sources and the actual artifacts of what you're doing. Um, it's really what you need. When it goes to the artifacts, the artifact is the forensic evidence that's left for us. That's what it looks like. If you don't have the artifact, you don't have history. History happened, but we don't have a record of it. 
The person did not make a record or did not make an artifact, and there's nothing for us to find to look at or examine if the artifact isn't made. Artifacts are very important. I have a box here of high-tech artifact creation equipment. <laughs> <laughs> pencil. When you, before you leave, take one. A short pencil beats a long memory. Write down the information that you have. Make your own artifacts. Because we look to the people of the past for the artifacts that they left. There are future people who are going to be looking at us. You might not have realized it, but you're historical people already. <coughs> and your artifacts are going to be the things that future researchers are going to be looking for. Write it down. Make a durable artifact of it. Don't rely on electronics. Electronics is like sometimes building a sandcastle on a beach. If the power goes out, if the power stays out, or if they change the manner of using the power. Like I'm, uh, remember the big floppies that were like this? Mm -hmm. How much information is lost because you can't read those floppies anymore? Or even the three and a half inch ones. There's information that's gone. That's gone. And it's been stored electronically. Or write it down. If you have pictures, print the important ones out. Write the people's names on the back. <laughs> you know, and the dates. Everybody goes, well, who's that? There's <laughs> nothing on the back. So use, use the short pencil. Uh, let's see. The last thing is stay curious. Get curious. Ask questions. Find your answers. And continue to connect your dots and lines. <laughs>